Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. DARPA's a place where if you don't invent the internet, you only get a B. A DARPA program manager quite literally invents tomorrow. Coming to work every day and being humbled by that. DARPA is not one person or one place. It's a collection of people that are excited about moving technology forward. For more than 60 years, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has held to a singular and enduring mission to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. Working with innovators inside and outside of government, DARPA has repeatedly delivered on that mission, transforming revolutionary concepts and even seeming impossibilities into practical capabilities. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's programs, partners, and performers. My name is Stacey Wurzba, and I'll be your DARPA host today. For today's Voices from DARPA podcast, we spoke with Dr. Alvaro Velasquez, who joined DARPA in August of 2022 as a program manager focused on artificial intelligence. His current research interests are at the intersection of formal language theory and machine learning for sequential decision making. He holds an interdisciplinary research record of more than 50 publications, including work in the areas of artificial intelligence, combinatorial optimization, and logic and circuit design. Here's Dr. Velasquez. So the reason I came to DARPA, it's actually largely informed by the past four years of my life. As soon as I got my PhD, I went to the Air Force Research Laboratory up in Rome, New York. And during that time, I oversaw four programs in machine learning as it applies to military operations. And I also did my own sort of basic research in that space. And I identified some problems that I thought were pretty critical, in particular when it came to adopting machine learning for modeling and simulation environments. And so I was very interested in doing research in that space. I still am. I consider myself a researcher at heart, not really a PM at heart. But I figured if I was going to make any kind of progress in this space, I needed the kind of visibility, reachability, funding that places like DARPA have. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your origin story. Sort of what got you excited about this field? Like, was there anything in childhood or any person in particular that sort of triggered your interest? When I was a kid, I watched Jurassic Park, the original Jurassic Park. I was between five and eight years old. And they called themselves scientists there. I guess they're paleontologists to be more specific, but they called themselves scientists at some point, at least in the Spanish translation. So I thought, wow, that's really cool. I want to be a scientist. And of course, I didn't really know what that meant, but I just kind of stuck with that simplistic ideal in my head. I'm going to be a scientist, going to be a scientist. So when eventually I graduated high school in Colombia, I decided to come here, go to university. Then during my PhD, I learned what being a scientist really is once I was already in too deep. Hundreds of hours of being miserable and your idea is not going anywhere. But a rare chance to pursue ideas worth pursuing, even if you fail at them. That's all you can really ask for is, a, is an honest chance at pursuing these ideas. Fast forward to the present. Dr. Velasquez immediately took ownership of a fledgling DARPA program known as Assured Neurosymbolic Learning and Reasoning, or ANSWER, and he didn't even have to draft a broad agency announcement, or BAA, a public document which outlines program details and metrics. It's an interesting story because back in January when I interviewed for this position, I proposed a program that I called Neurosymbolic Autonomy, which ended up being very, very similar to the program I have now taken over. So three days after I was interviewed, Sandeep Nima, whose term just ended, was supposed to pitch his program, which was Neurosymbolic Learning and Reasoning, very similar program. So in some sense, everything worked out. So I came right during the source selection phase, which is, to me, it's the fun part, right? You get to read all the proposals, see what the community's up to. Uh, I had been doing research in the space, but I was in my own little sub area of Neurosymbolic AI. What is Neurosymbolic AI and how does it relate to DARPA? So neurosymbolic AI, as, as the name suggests, is the integration of symbolic methods as well as data-driven neural methods. So this requires some of the history of AI. So the first wave of AI was largely characterized by symbolic systems. These are systems whose dynamics we understand fully. For example, in industrial applications or warehouse applications, we know how things work. We can define them as a set of rules, which are basically symbolic structures, and we can reason over these symbolic structures. 
and that's great. They're easy to verify. They're easy to understand mathematically. They have all kinds of nice properties, but they don't generalize to the unknown. And so that's the big problem with the first wave of AI, what we'll call the symbolic wave. The second wave of AI has been largely characterized by reasoning about the opposite, by reasoning about experience as opposed to hardcore details of how the underlying phenomena work and how the pieces fit together. That's the conjecture that if you have enough data and enough experience, you should, in principle, be able to learn what the phenomena of interest is and generalize to new domains that you haven't observed before. And there are neat mathematical underpinnings as to why we believe that. There are things like the universal approximation theorem, which says that if you take a crude abstraction of the mammalian brain, what we'll call a neural network, it's a very, very crude abstraction. If you have enough nonlinearities in it, you should be able to approximate any nonlinear function to arbitrary precision. And so we're mapping these relevant phenomena that we want to characterize, we're mapping them to some kind of nonlinear function that we don't know, but with enough experience, the neural network will learn it for us. So it's an entirely different space when compared to the symbolic. Now this allows us to generalize to some extent, something we couldn't do symbolically, but now we've lost a lot of the nice properties of the symbolic structures. These things are very hard to verify, they're hard to reason about mathematically. It's hard to prove that they'll do the right thing, things like convergence guarantees, for example. So these are very sort of brittle systems in some sense. So the idea is that you should be able to take both of these and integrate them somehow, which is easier said than done, so that you can maintain the benefits of both waves of AI, right? So you can retain the assurance from the symbolic wave and some of the generalization from the second wave of data-driven neural models. Okay, sounds interesting. How do you plan to apply that knowledge in the Assured Neurosymbolic Learning and Reasoning Program? So we're looking at that integration of the neural and the symbolic. It's cut across four areas, the basic algorithm architecture design, how you would verify such systems. So again, the verification in order to establish assurance, that's well understood. Purely symbolically is well understood. In recent years, there's been some progress on the neural side. But having these integrated and how you would verify both of these things together, that's sort of an open question. Because when you reason about these things mathematically, for example, the neural models are capturing some kind of highly nonlinear, smooth manifold, whereas the symbolic are capturing something entirely different. It's not smooth. It's something like a discrete representation, like discrete geometry or something like this. So these are completely different things, right? In smooth manifold, tools from calculus would apply, for example, whereas in these discrete geometries, they would not because it's not smooth. So the way you reason about these together, that's sort of not well understood yet. So that's the second thrust. The third thrust, we're looking at some actual real-life capabilities. I won't go into too much details, but there's some military-relevant capabilities that we would apply this to. And then the final trust is your standard test and evaluation to make sure these things work the way they're supposed to. If we apply adversarial attacks, for example, are they going to break down? Are they robust to these kinds of adversarial attacks? So those are the four main areas under that program. But I have some ideas as well for some other programs that I would like to pursue. When new program managers begin at DARPA, they're encouraged to develop and pitch ideas that can prevent or impose strategic surprise to national security in their areas of expertise. Beyond the answer program, Dr. Velasquez has his sights set for additional research that can address the military's limitations with modeling and simulation environments. So at AFRL, whenever some new autonomous technology would come out, we would hear from chief scientists and people on high, why can't we take this autonomous technology, you know, things like AlphaGo, which beat the World Go champion, or AlphaStar, or OpenAI5. There were all these cool technologies coming out at the time. And naturally, the first instinct is we should be able to apply this to military problems, right? These involve multiple agents reasoning about uncertain environments. They have some game theory. They have long-term objectives. There are some very clear military analogs to these games. So why can't we adopt them? And there are a couple of reasons. So when you look at military modeling and simulation, in the case of the Air Force, we use tools like AFSIM and AWSIM. AFSIM is the Advanced Framework for Simulation, Integration, and Modeling. Army uses OPSIM. I'm not sure what Navy uses. But the point is that all of these high fidelity simulation environments, they were never designed with efficiency in mind, with artificial intelligence in mind. They were designed to evaluate courses of action. They were designed to train operators and things like this. So 
let's say they run at about one minute per execution is the fastest you can do with something like AFSIM for a medium-sized campaign. And then you look at the state of the art that the academic community deals with, these require tens of millions of executions. So clearly we're not going to run this for tens of millions of minutes, right? This is many years of runtime. The power budgets alone on these things would cost millions of dollars. So that whole line of inquiry becomes intractable. Okay, with that in mind, what can you do in this space? So what I wanted to address is how can we learn over some surrogate simulation environment, transfer the learned capabilities over to the military MS, and then transfer from the military MS to a real life platform. Now, there are a ton of little technical challenges there that are open questions that have not been addressed by the academic community, much less by the operational community. So for example, when you think about transfer learning from a vision perspective, that's fairly well understood. That's been looked into quite a bit. You might imagine, for example, that you want to classify some military sensitive vehicle for which we have very little data. And so it would be very difficult to learn directly over that little bit of data. But you can take your learning model, let's say a neural network. You can learn over something like ImageNet, which has like a million images. You can learn over their vehicles data set or whatever data set. You freeze the earlier parameters of the neural network, and then you only retrain the later parameters on your sensitive data. And something like this can work very well, right, in theory. Now, why is that? That's because when you look at the earlier layers of your neural network, you're learning very simple primitives, like edge detectors. In principle, if you have enough edge detectors and a fancy way of putting them together, you should be able to detect just about anything in an image. So basically, an edge detector forms your core piece of transferability from a vision perspective, right? What does that look like from a sequential decision-making perspective, which is what we want with modeling and simulation environments? In modeling and simulation environments, we're not just trying to detect an aircraft. We're trying to say, okay, we detected an aircraft. What do we do? Move to the left, move to the right, shoot it down, go here, go there, assign a new target, blah, blah, blah. So these are sequential decision-making problems. So they add all kinds of additional uh, idiosyncrasies and challenges. And it's not clear what the atomic piece of transferability is from a sequential decision-making perspective. That's one thing. A second thing, it's not clear what an atomic piece of transferability is from a symbolic perspective. When I mention edge detectors, this is from a purely neural perspective. From a symbolic perspective, is that a subset of a kill chain? Is that a subset of some specific logic that defines the objective of the agent? You know, this is, it's not clear what it is. Now, those are two of the key challenges, and then they underpin the greater challenge, which would be how do you then integrate those to do the neurosymbolic transfer learning so that you can address these data limitations of adopting the state of the art within the state of the military. Though he may only be at the beginning of his chapter at DARPA, Dr. Velasquez has an idea on how he'd like to see this part of his story end. The legacy. The legacy is to finally apply machine learning to a complex military problem and demonstrate it as a real-life capability? That's a good question. What would my legacy be at DARPA? That's a deep question. I think I'll have to think more on that. Okay. That's my first initial answer, but I'll take another stab at it okay. in the future. Going back to one of my earlier answers on doing a PhD where you're miserable for hundreds of hours and things fail, but every now and then you, you, you get a glimpse of something meaningful, you know, and it, it's rare, but when you get a glimpse of that, like that just, that just energizes you, you know, that can keep you going. And then even once that goes away, you know, statistically speaking, that at some point within the next few years, there will be another such glimpse. And this time you might be able to actually catch it and do something with it. So just the sheer potential of it all is, is more than enough to get me up in the morning. Thank you for listening to this Voices from DARPA podcast. And special thanks to Tom Shortridge for producing this podcast and to Heather Dees for her assistance. To learn more about DARPA or to listen to more Voices from DARPA episodes, visit DARPA.mil.